give like an update on um, us talking about Walker because I feel like I want to address that on the pod. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you to, to that we should probably put yeah. our whole theory that isn't even a conspiracy at this point <laughs> all together yeah. on here. <laughs> so I decided to piggyback off of the discussion that's happening around Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds to talk about Walker because just talking about Walker on his own for some reason nobody was like getting it mm -hmm. you know what I mean like people were like oh well I'd rather hear that I didn't get a job because of puberty because that's at least not my fault and it's like no they're kind of saying it is his fault yes. um, explicitly so his fault <laughs> Yeah, so, um, like, that's the, the, like, sense of what, like, I got in my comments. I know for you, it was, it was a little bit worse. People were a little more combative. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just interesting that, like, in order for people to get what was really going on with that weird statement that they, um, what was his name? Sam, is, is it Sam Levy or am I thinking the wrong? Levy. Yeah. Or Sean, um, sorry, sorry, Sean, Sean Levy. Levy. Yeah, Sam Levy is, I think, from Euphoria. But anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, for whatever reason, making that statement about his voice dropping, about him getting too tall, and I, when we first started discussing this, I had not watched the scenes with like the Deadpool variants, like so it makes even less sense when you consider that it wasn't like there was just a kid pool there and that was it, like. It wasn't like there was one very <laughs> no yeah so, it was a scene where there was a bunch of them all at all in one place yeah um, yeah so there was literally no reason they couldn't have thrown him a costume even with lake and ryan's children being in there mm -hmm. especially since i found a friend of mine sent me an article last night that listed other people that were in that scene and one of them was Tom Holland, who plays Spider-Man, his brother, who was born in 1999. And I was like, oh, okay. So you can put somebody else in this scene who's just a brother of somebody in Marvel who probably did not memorize the entirety of Deadpool 2 by the age of 11, mm -hmm. probably didn't do that. <laughs> and you can put them in that movie when they're 10 years older than Walker. Mm -hmm. But when it's Walker, Nope, it's because it's, it's his puberty and he has to apologize for growing up in interviews now. That's so okay. stupid. Like, yeah, it was... that, like really got me because this is like one of these things that I do is I just know that something is true and I'm like, I don't need to find proof. Somebody else can do this for me. And yeah. so, because I just know that it's true and I just like don't bother to do that. And then people on the internet yell at me and say like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, why don't you know this already? It's so obvious. And so one of the things I like finally looked up last night was they put out that ridiculous statement about Walker that came out of nowhere. Like it, mm. it was like days after like the premiere that he went to. So it made like no sense that on yeah. this random day, they just put out this statement about him anyway. They put them out that that came out in Entertainment Weekly on August 5th. Mm -hmm. August 6th was the super weird. It ends with us like um, premiere where they were like sitting in different rooms and the two stars like didn't interact and they were never pictured together. And so I'm like, you guys literally like last minute panicked that people were gonna turn against you during all of this, which is what happened. And so you threw a literal child who worships you under the bus. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's so obvious when you look at that, that, that that was clearly like a last minute Hail Mary sort of thing to be like, don't blame us for this. It's totally the kid's fault. And and it's like, um, if anything, that this whole thing has proven just how much of like nepotism runs mm -hmm. Hollywood because even though Walker is the star of Percy Jackson, he still got screwed over yeah because he has no nepotism he's not related to anybody famous he doesn't know anyone famous he lives in pennsylvania <laughs> like his family is not famous at all they're extremely normal people from a normal family they don't have connections with anybody he he like he had connections with the people who totally fucked him over <laughs> and so even though he had these connections in the end it didn't matter 
because he's not related to anybody who's famous. And I was just like, this is so gross. <laughs> yeah. And um, the what adds to it for me, too, is because when I was trying to upload a clip onto our YouTube, I always end up watching a bunch of shorts and stuff while it's uploading to, like, just stay on the app. And um, almost every single, like, walker is Percy, but, like, interview clips um, has at least one or two clips of him doing a Deadpool impression while he was on the Adam Project or doing press tours for the Adam Project. So <laughs> Ryan Reynolds had no problem making Baby Walker do his little Deadpool impression, but when the time came for it, we're not going to do that, no. Yeah, the when he was announced as Percy, the Kraft Mac and Cheese commercial was everywhere yes. on Twitter. And people being like, okay, that's Percy. I'm done worrying about anything. <laughs> like, we're, we're good. Like, that is, that's the exact sort of thing you need to do to pull off that, this sort of role, so we're fine. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you're fine with a literal 12-year-old kid who worships you memorizing your entire movie where there's interviews during the press junction where he just starts reciting Deadpool 2 from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, it reminded me of me when I was younger with different movies because I did that too with multiple movies when I was around that age. Yeah. Um, but they're fine with that when it's that when it's cute and it's like Walker being cute like that they're good but now like three years later they won't hesitate to throw him under the bus and start this whole horrible discourse i don't even know what to call it a discourse but it turned into one about whether he's a good actor anymore because he went through puberty yeah and specifically whether he's a good actor for these two roles he really wanted this lighting is gonna bug me hold on <laughs> my leo moment um the lines from the okay that's worse <laughs> It's also just, I don't know, the thing that always gets to me about all this, like you said already, is that nobody cared about it mm -hmm. when we were talking about it just about him. Um, that we had to make it about like a bigger issue yeah. for people to care about it when it's just him. And it's like, do you guys get the like, if he's being treated this way and he's the star of a huge show on Disney, like imagine how other kids are being treated who are not him. Exactly. And if he's being thrown under the bus this aggressively where he's being forced to answer questions about how he grew too much at D23, and which is what sent me into a rage in the first place, that somebody actually asked him about it and he had to sit there and talk about it at all. Like, shut up. Why are you why are you asking some like a 15 year old kid about that? But it's just I don't even know what to say anymore. It's just how like it's how Hollywood and people in general treat kids that they just see them as like disposable or they don't like consider that they're their own people. Mm -hmm. And like how you would feel if like something like that happened to you, it was just like, oh, well, yeah, he's a kid, so he grew too much. So obviously he's not gonna have the role. And like from the beginning, I was like, I don't know why you're believing this anyway, but even if you do believe this stupid statement that doesn't make any sense, that's wildly inappropriate. Yeah to ever even use that as a reason for why you didn't give, especially because he could have been somebody in this scene without anyone even knowing that he was in this scene. That's like something that every big Disney-ish movie does. Like there were people in every Star Wars movie that nobody knew was in Star Wars until they told everybody afterwards, like, oh, this random person was this famous- Nightly. Yeah. And like literally all of them are like that. There's a somebody like that in a lot of the big marvel movies too and so it's not like they could have just done that if they actually were going to but they never were going to do that and the the other thing about this that doesn't have anything to do with walker that i think is like fascinating mm -hmm. is that people are obsessing about old clips or just blake lively and, and ryan reynolds being incredibly tone deaf about domestic violence Mm -hmm. um, but nobody has brought up the fact that they're straight up exploiting their children. Like, do you think a one-year-old or a seven-year-old had an actual choice about whether they wanted to be in this movie? Or yeah. like, if they want Taylor Swift to write songs with their name in it, so the entire world is like making up stories about them and their lives because they're in these songs? Like, no! There's absolutely no way that they that they had any role in that their children are making them part of their like promotional material 
that's mm -hmm. fucked up on its own. <laughs> and everyone just like skips past that. And they're like, but she was a bitch to this actress once. And I'm like, what about her own kids? Yeah. Like if, if they're treating their own kids like that, I don't even want to think about the kind of stuff they would say to like child actors that they run into. Well, yeah. And like people get so weird over kids, like Hollywood kids in particular. And we've seen that, like we've seen a lot more of it, but in our lifetime, they've passed like laws where paparazzi can't target families and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of those kids did not enjoy their time in the spotlight. It sounds very much like what Chapel Roan has been talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like you're getting thrust into a world where that is your reality. That is something that could happen. You people could try to figure out where you go to school, um, what what you know, like soccer team you play on. Every fun thing can get taken from you because you're in the spotlight and you didn't choose that for yourself. And they already yeah. have that factor as just the children as celebrities. Yeah, and to be honest, like that kind of stuff has been happening to Walker already, where. Mm -hmm. Like people have been posting photos of him at his high school with like his high school name on it, which makes me want to panic every time I see one of those pop up on Instagram. They like posted photos of him doing just like high school activities. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, okay, so what can this kid do when he's not filming if you're going to post where he goes to school? Yeah. And like he already doesn't have like the other day I saw this interview clip of him where he said that a fan texted him, why do you have his phone number? Why, why, why is that even out there? How did they even find that? Why do they know that? So it's like, he already has people invading every aspect of his, of his life. Mm -hmm. And now on top of it, they're talking about just like normal developmental things in a very public space as well. It's like every part of him that should be private is being exposed very publicly and there is no reason for any of it to be happening this way like you don't need to do this for him to be percy it would probably be a lot easier to act every day on set if he didn't open up his phone and have random strangers texting him asking for like a copy of the script exactly. <laughs> and, like other whatever other things we don't even know about is happening much less could be happening with the other kids as well though I'm sure that he gets like the brunt of it since he is like the star of the whole thing. But, but still like, that's wild that this could even be happening and that there are adults that were like, yeah, it's fine that an adult is talking about a child's body. That's totally fine. That doesn't like bring up problems when abuse does happen. <laughs> like, you know, if abuse happens on set and you notice that somebody's being a fucking weirdo and they're commenting on a kid's body and you think that that's weird you might notice it faster like that might happen you might notice it faster if you notice that a an adult talking about a kid's body is strange yeah but if, you, if you like let it go and argue with me for days that it's fine to talk about this stuff publicly and that puberty is not a dirty word <laughs> That's not what our argument was. That was no, what it was. No one is saying that puberty is a dirty word. I want you to go online and talk about intimately about your puberty in front of a million people and then get back to me and see how you feel about that. Yeah, Those yeah. are two very different things, but it's more that than like the knee jerk reaction from people is still to defend what the adults are doing. And I'm just like, that needs to somehow stop. And I don't know how it's not my responsibility, but it would make my life a lot easier if we, <laughs> if people finally stopped doing that because that's the kid is the one that needs the help yeah. never 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 the adults ryan reynolds is just fine yeah yeah and with walker and him going to a real high school the worry for me as a mom i, I always have to say this now because i'm closer in age or my son is closer in age to walker than i am so i do think of him like a baby child that could be mine um yeah. but uh when when it comes to this age that he's at right now um when you think back like the olsen twins um it was kind of a plot point on one of the shows i don't remember which one but um that Spencer Pratt guy who was dating somebody. Yeah. Sorry, low battery. Um, he was dating somebody that was on reality TV 
and he went to high school with the Olsen twins. He would send pictures of them at parties to um, to different like tabloids and stuff, which like poor Mary Kate, they couldn't even make teenage mistakes. No, they can't do anything. Yeah. And so like with Walker and Leah, especially um, because they are kind of like 15, 16, um, and they're still high school age, you know, the other ones are kind of like adults enough. Um, they're the ones that are gonna get hit really hard if they do some of that teenage experimenting. And especially I, Leah, especially Leah. Yeah, and I don't know how they couldn't because being under this sort of pressure would just make you need to do that even more because it's like, you need to like let out some, you need to have like a private life, just mm -hmm. period. You just need to have a private life that is not in the public, like what Chaperone was saying. Like, this is like my public life, but my public life is not me all the time. They yeah. need to have some sort of identity outside of their public persona. They can't be performing all the time. Mm -hmm. You need that or else you're going to lose your mind. And so if you're a teenager going through that, yeah, you should like do that sort of stuff. Like go out with your friends, go to parties, go to stuff like that without having to worry that if you do that, somebody is going to post that stuff online and you're going to get in trouble with Disney. Yeah. You need to like be able to be around people enough to trust that that stuff won't leak online. And like at this point, I don't know how either one of them could believe that that would happen because everything has been leaking online, at least on Walker's end. So many private things are just online and people aren't even seeing it as a problem. They're just like posting it and thinking that it's funny. And I'm like, this is, this is upsetting. <laughs> I, I just like watch them and I, I feel like I'm their mom, like you said, because I, I just remember how hard those years are when I didn't have any of this stuff going on. And I just can't imagine how difficult all this stuff would be on top of all. It's the thing with this whole situation with Walker and stuff is that I'm like, I know that this is going to be something that he's going to talk about with a therapist one day. Yeah. Like, I just know that. Like, I know enough about kids and developmental stuff and just how difficult something like this will is to know that that's probably what this is a difficult thing for him. And it it makes me really mad to see it happen and to watch and especially watch interviews with him where I know that this is like going to bother him a lot because how could it not? Yeah. Like you're, you're being a normal kid. Just tr you're trying to be a normal kid. Like when he tried out for Percy Jackson, he was on set of the movie he did with Ryan Reynolds. It was his first movie he ever did. He had no idea what would happen to his life when he started playing Percy Jackson. Absolutely not. He was a 12 year old little baby child who was on his first movie set. He had no idea how that could possibly change his life. And now he's seeing how it's changing his life. And he's still, he just finished his freshman year of high school. <laughs> yeah. like, nobody can handle that well at that age because you're not supposed to be handling things like that at that age. You're supposed to be a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, after after all of this, like, it's not really like there's any solution to this. The movie's already out. It's already done. But what what I am thankful for is that while this is happening, he is on the set that we feel is a lot more supportive and that these people have his back. I'm sure a lot of them were like, you know, like you would have been much better in that part anyway, like saying stuff like that to make him feel better. Yeah, like Becky, Becky on um, threads was very displeased. Mm -hmm. and was just wrote literally like no <laughs> when she saw like the first story about it and was just like no and was they obviously didn't know that any of that happened because they made it up <laughs> yeah and so like but anyway it's not like he would have called up rick riordan even if that actually did happen to him <laughs> that's not something you want to tell people but yeah. it, but i do think that it's like a grace from like jesus that he is on set every day and not in high school because yeah. I cannot imagine comments from high school students about this stuff. And so at least by the time he goes back to school, it will be like many, many months from now and he won't have to deal with it as much by then. Yeah. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's get into the chapters.
Um, so we read chapters three and four of Titan's Curse, and we are starting off with Bianca's choice. Um, so um, let's see. They, um, I'm trying to think of the order of how it happens because I read this on like Saturday. Um, so they set up their camp, um, and uh, Nico's kind of, you know, like, I love Nico. He's just like so excited and is like ready for this because of the mytho magic game. Um, and especially when you consider he's supposed to be 10, right? It feels on brand, the like dancing around, like, and especially the fact that he's still thinking about it in video, like not video game, in card game terms, um, mm -hmm. very much makes me think of William. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's so young that he, there's no way he can know like the seriousness really mm -hmm. of any of it because he's way too young to like get it. Yeah. And at this point, we don't know which God um they haven't said that but they have told them they're demigods and i don't know that the kids even know enough like because all we know about them so far is that they're orphans so i don't even know that they know enough to think who which parent is it mm -hmm. and especially because of where they were for most of their life like there is a little a little bit of a hint there that like they don't remember anything about anything before they showed up at this school and that the tuition is just like magically paid for <laughs> and but that's like all they know about anything and so that does give you a hint that something weird is going on but there's nothing especially because of who their who their godly parent is there really isn't anything that they could have this parent there isn't anything that you could do that that would like tip people off who you're parent is necessarily it's not like a easy like water power thing like percy could do you can't like accidentally use it in the same way it would be horrifying <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. my God. i mean the books are old we can we can say their parent is hades um so yeah um <laughs> so it would be really really horrifying if it's just like necromancy out of nowhere yeah, like nico's in the and like walking by uh by like a bunch of dead like a bunch of like graves and just all of a sudden just starts bringing no that's definitely not something that ever happened thank god yeah because <laughs> that would be that would be bad enough just on its own yeah <laughs> um let's see so then um pretty quickly in the chapter we have artemis take away bianca and i mean it's I think it's pretty apparent what she's going to ask her when she leads her away. Bianca is perfectly the right age. Bianca is literally the same age that Art Artemis is cosplaying as. Um, so, you know, like, it's very apparent that she's about to make this offer, especially because Artemis, you know, like, tells Grover, keep Nico busy. Mm -hmm. And the only one who fully understands is Thalia. Mm -hmm. um, but for some, well, I, I can't really blame her for not wanting to say what's happening out loud. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you say to something like that? Yeah. Um, but she is, she's the only one who knows because she's the only one who's dealt with them before. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, someone's asking, I never understood why she made the offer. Um, I think it's extremely messed up that mm -hmm. Artemis even offered this to this 12 year old girl when she knows what's going on mm -hmm. and the reason why they're there and the reason why they're even trying to help them or like bring them back to camp is because they're literally dying and they're being attacked by horrible things she knows what those things are and she mm -hmm. knows that it's happening she's not naive to it and she's still like let me take this kid for me because I like apparently abducting children <laughs> like i yeah. like doing this so why not it's just in it it's so reading these chapters was so weird when it comes to artemis because she's one of the gods that people generally think is nice and i'm like you're really manipulative and horrible why didn't why does nobody talk about you like this like you're taking a 12 year old kid from his little brother and you don't care and you're taking them away from a bunch of kids that are you know is fighting against things that they can't win against 
and you don't need this little girl like you don't need her at all you'll be fine without her but yeah. they won't <laughs> yeah so with artemis the hunters weren't exactly in the way that like Rick paints them. I do like what he did with the idea of her having a band of hunters around her, um, where it is her recruiting different girls and girls in need, which like makes me think of Carlisle from Twilight. Um, very much like I want to make my own family, so I'll just take people that I think have no other choice. Um, mm. And like, that's how Carlisle lets himself get away with turning other people into vampires. That's how she's kind of getting away with these people are going to be maidens forever like me. Um, and like in the stories where she does have hunters, it's, it's not clear like any circumstances that bring people in, but you think of stories like Callisto where she, um, sometimes it seems like it, I can't remember if Callisto was a consenty situation or not with Zeus but she had relations with Zeus. Sometimes it was in the disguise of Artemis. Sometimes it was like Zeus like just did it. Um, and then because she got pregnant and got discovered, she gets taken out by Artemis. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like, this is a binding promise. And once you break it, you're like dead. And it's, it's also just like, I, I, we, I made notes when we did our, um, our episode about grooming mm -hmm. and I was just thinking about them like the first sign is you know um, picking somebody who's vulnerable Bianca is obviously very vulnerable she just found out that she's this thing that she doesn't understand and people are coming after her to try to hurt her mm -hmm. that's a very vulnerable situation you isolate them from their their support system literally the first thing they do is take her away from her little brother so that they can get her alone so that she will say yes to things she otherwise wouldn't say if her little brother was there because there's no reason for you to do this without Nico there and without him knowing what you're about to do unless you know that she's not going to say yes if he's there mm -hmm. like that's and like keeping secrets this whole thing is a secret like Percy saying there yell like the only person that's like being rational is the 14 year old traumatized child that is like stop like what are you doing stop stop like what about your brother why are you giving up your entire life like yeah he has to sit there and try to like try to like present camp as if he's trying to like sell it on in like an infomercial or something because they're like taking this little child away from her entire life and she doesn't even understand what what they're even asking her to do she's not because they literally tell her like the thing that any 12 year old oldest daughter would ever want to hear, which is still a lie. Yeah. <laughs> but they tell her something that sounds so good that they know that she's going to say yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just a wild thing to watch them, her and Artemis and Zoe do that and literally don't give a fuck about the 10 year old little boy who has absolutely nobody now. Yeah, it's just why <laughs> yeah and um so with bianca making the choice to become a huntress um percy like it all happens before his eyes before he could even stop it which is like also a frustrating part to read is like he because i feel like he doesn't even get a chance to say come to camp with me like you don't you can train until you're an adult and you can grow up and like all of that until after she says the pledge and Artemis says, I accept. So and he's trying as much as he can, but he also doesn't know what's going on because they kept it a secret from him until it's literally happening in front of him. Mm -hmm. So he is trying, but it's but it's also happening so quickly that he doesn't even like he doesn't even have time to like sit there and talk to Bianca. Yeah. And like camp is like this. You don't know about what these people are asking you to do. Do you want it? Do you really want your life to end when you're this? Like, do you want to be 12 years old forever? Like, mm -hmm. they don't even he he doesn't they make it happen so quickly so that it can stop before anyone else could possibly stop them. That there's just no time, and especially for for Percy's perspective, like where he says, like I lost so much. And I feel like this was all for nothing. Like they came to the school to help these kids, to bring them back 
to camp, his best friend was taken while they were trying to help these kids. And now one of them has joined the hunters. So it's like, what point was it for me to do this and for my best friend to be taken by horrible people when you just like stole this girl away from us? So like, there was no point of us even going through this, but it happened anyway. Yeah. And um, let's see. So Bianca takes the pledge. She says she feels like stronger immediately. Um, there's no visible change to her and there's never going to be ever again. Um, and, uh, then we have Artemis asking Percy to escort everybody back to camp. And that stuck out to me because as, as much as we're about to shit on her, she didn't ask Talia to do it. <laughs> she, no. she told Percy. And I get that that's probably because of history with yeah. the hunters, but at the same time, if Talia was the best person for the job to protect these young girls. She would have done it because that's her job, you know, mm -hmm. and Artemis very much puts up this front of, you know, I'm all business, you know, so I, I'm not going to put emotion into it and I'm going to be a 12 year old mean girl at the same time somehow. Um, so if, if Percy was not the best person, I don't think she would have done that. And I do think it says something that she chose him to give that mission and that responsibility. Yeah, it's like the one thing that he can sort of hang on to, but he doesn't at all because he's like, I really don't like you right now. So, so I don't care that yeah. you asked me to do this. Um, but I will say just for the stuff with Bianca as I'm, I'm an older sister. So I take it very offensively that she abandoned her younger siblings so easily. Yeah. And like, like literally the one thing I, one of the things I remembered about this book was that this happened. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this child that she abandoned her younger sibling that easily. And I get that a literal God was like, oh, if you join our family, you don't have any responsibilities except that you have to give up your entire identity yeah. and, and, and you can never do anything with men ever. Because if you do that, you are immediately kicked out of the family. And everybody knows that. Like, usually, if you have something hanging over your head with family members, that doesn't make a conducive, happy environment. Just generally. Yeah, <laughs> but I also feel like I can talk about this and rant about this for a while about a fictional 12-year-old child. Because I went through worse things, much worse things than, than this fictional kid did. I did. I can't say what those things are here because TikTok would get very mad at me. And so would YouTube. But the, just imagine like the worst things that can happen to a child in a family. That was me. That, that was happening to me. And I never ran away from home because I had a younger sister. And that younger sister was also horrible to me and was also part of the abuse I was going through. But I still stayed at home and I still stayed there with her. And I never like ran away from her, tried to leave home. I didn't even tell our parents the horrible thing she was doing to me when we were growing up. I still haven't like to this day. Like I saw my mom today and she like was like, I don't understand why you don't like your sister. And I just didn't say anything <laughs> because she didn't say it like that simply. She's like, I know you get mad at her, but she also did these other things when we weren't talking. And I just said nothing because I'm not saying this stuff to her at this. That's not a good idea. But it's just, I actually went through a horrible fucking shit that if I went to the police, they would have arrested people. And I didn't do that. And part of the reason why I didn't do that is because I thought I had to protect my sister from what would happen to her if I did do that. I didn't know what would happen to her if I did that. And so I didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And so I know exactly what it's like to be under crazy pressure as the oldest sibling, but never in my life did it ever occur to me to just abandon my younger sister and leave. Yeah. Never. It's taken six years of therapy for me to even get to the point where I can like try to separate myself from her in any way. Like granted, that's not healthy, but still just the idea that she so easily is just like, bye Nico. I'm tired of like being responsible for you. It's not your fault. You're just, you were just born second. But I'm, you know, putting that on you anyway, and I'm going to leave now. Peace. <laughs> yeah. Just, it's unbelievable. 
And poor Percy is sitting there like, okay, am I going to have to be the person to break this poor little boy's heart? Like, what is going to happen to him now? Uh, Percy's literally the only one here. And I do have to say, Artemis has hunted with men before. There was no reason why she couldn't invite Nico as well. She has also been willing to take in men, willing to pledge away romance and sex. So there is no reason for her to say only one of you, other than the idea that she's afraid of her existing hunters getting tainted. And uh, I, I do think that for her, the, the draw really is sex, but I don't think she understands it. And like, I, I'm gonna be honest, cause I don't like Artemis at all right now. Part of me just wants to say that you being homophobic <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's Nico. I have no idea <laughs> like if that's true i don't care nobody can tell me that i'm wrong <laughs> yeah. but it's also just a thing of like why wouldn't you do that if it helps everybody stay together yeah like Fred and nico would like forever be 10 but whatever at least he would not go through the mind-numbing trauma that he goes through for the rest of this series like jesus christ it's horrible what happens to him especially in the fourth book it's Oh my God, <laughs> it's so horrible. And none of that had to happen the way that it did. It really, it just, it just didn't. Um, one, th one thing I wanted to say before we start about the Artemis stuff though, is mm -hmm. the one part where, uh, where Percy is like agreeing with Thalia about, about not liking them taking Bianca away because he knows that something is something weird is happening but he doesn't know what it is and then thalia immediately like switches to just yelling at him about annabeth that it's somehow his fault um, yeah and and i have to say something about that because that that seems like projection 100 percent when you consider that she says had we stuck together who was the girl who danced away miss talia mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's oh my god so this 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 statement goes out to every golden child who has not gotten help like my wonderful co-host like best friend here if you are a raging asshole whenever somebody talks to you no one is going to go to you with anything at all exactly you go and talk to somebody if every time you talk to them they cut your head off and make you feel like a horrible person like I know like last time I said like Percy's gonna blame himself and then in this chapter he's like Annabeth getting kidnapped is my fault and I was just like oh my god <laughs> like and so he's already thinking that it's his fault that his best friend is being tortured by people who wanted to torture him instead the last thing he needs is you yelling at him about this because you don't have a better coping mechanism exactly. like when I was reading this I was like find a better coping mechanism than yelling at somebody when you don't have control of the situation like i don't know how one of the things that people argue about with salia sometimes is like oh what is her fatal flaw control mm -hmm. control like people talk about sometimes oh percy sometimes wants control no no thalia is a control freak like she sits there and screams at him. Why? Because she didn't have control of the situation. She yeah. says, oh, if you would have just come to me, I would have been able to handle this better than you and everything would have ended up being fine because I'm better than you. No, there's absolutely no guarantee that the situation would have been better if she knew about it because when they were all outside fighting, she didn't kill anybody. She, she fought the monster, nobody died. Like the monster didn't die. The monster still lived after you fought them. So it didn't matter in the end if you knew about it beforehand or not. Like it doesn't, especially in this situation because they were trying to kidnap Percy. Like no matter what, they would have gone after Percy alone in some way. Mm -hmm. And so it's like what, it's very similar to things that happen when they're at camp and however, I, I don't know when that is. So, but eventually we're going to read it where something happens between them at camp that is literally the exact same thing where she blames him and screams at him and other things besides that 
because she's mad that he didn't follow her plan because she's convinced that if he did that everything would work out the way she wanted there's no guarantee that that it actually isn't isn't true like we'll talk about it completely when we get to that chapter but i reread it before we even read these books and i kept seeing people talk about that and and blame it on percy and say that he was the one in the wrong and i was like no she's the one in the wrong here she's acting like if she wants to do something her plan is going to work because it's her plan and yeah. everyone else sh should just have to like go along with what she wants because it's what she that's not how any of this stuff works like that's not how you get along with people is by making them afraid of you that they never that they don't like he's like she sits there and screams at him and he just stands there because it's like what do you he, he can't say anything like if she attacks him like that when she's when he's agreeing with her he can't say anything at yeah. all without her like somehow her being like oh you're trying to be a big tough strong man and do everything on your own and it's like what about him makes you think that he's that sort of person like he saw two children being kidnapped and was like i should probably stop them yeah <laughs> that's not about ego <laughs> and it, it um i always remember this one interview that walker scovell did where he he said something about how thalia and percy are a good example of how zeus and poseidon like never get along mm -hmm. and i'm like i've never thought about it like that before but he was definitely correct about that that they show how they're similar but not really they're like actually extremely different and it just like these little things that just i can never imagine percy ever talking to somebody like this like ever even when he's at like his absolute worst that's just not how he and just like the idea of thinking like it's my way or the highway yeah no that's like the that's the absolute opposite of who he is as a person yeah, and well, that that point you made about Zeus and Poseidon, though, like the the that actually, so there's so much to confirm that when you think about it, because you can think of Zeus as a golden child in a way. He's the one who got saved from getting swallowed, and mm -hmm. because he's the one who got saved from getting swallowed and got raised, you know, and um, supported as he was overthrowing his father, he's king of the gods. But that is a very precarious seat because one person got castrated and got thrown off the other person got cut up to bits and put in tartarus um so you know all it takes is somebody trying and succeeding to like physically overthrow him for him to be conquered and no longer have his seat of power um and yeah talia she's she's kind of treated in this book already as if she's more powerful or somewhat more capable than Percy when she's literally been a tree for the past four years. Yeah. And also like the thing I didn't really say the way I wanted to in the last episode when I was talking about like how ridiculous the hierarchy stuff that everyone just falls into, even like people that I know love Percy, like Kyra okay. and like Grover and Annabeth fall in fall into this is the thing I was trying to say, but I didn't really say it right to me, at, at least in my head, I didn't think I said it right, is that hierarchies like this make everybody helpless. Mm -hmm. Like if there's one person at the top that everyone just like goes to for help, that one person ha is the one that decides everything, but it means that everyone else is just kind of sitting around not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And that is a dynamic that happens in like dysfunctional slash like abusive family systems is that one person runs everything. And yes. so nobody knows how to like say how they feel, make any decisions at all. Like we have been in therapy forever because we don't know how to make decisions about our own lives. Like who we are as people, what we want to do with our lives, our jobs. Like, I don't even know what food I like. Like I try food sometimes that I think I don't like because I don't even know if I actually don't like it anymore. Yeah. And, and like the basic level things. And so that same thing is happening with the kids at like, at, eventually we'll get to camp where we see that happening at camp. But it's also just happening in these small situations where everybody is so dependent on Thalia that they all just 
don't do the things that they normally would do. And it leads to things like this happening. Like if people were not being so dependent on only her and they were thinking for themselves, like why did Annabeth run off to get Thalia when she noticed that they were gone instead of like, you know, figuring out something else? Like she's the smart, like at least intelligence wise, she's the smartest one out of all of them. Mm -hmm. She can figure things out on her own. But yeah. even her, she was like, I need to go get Thalia. And it's like, why? You don't actually need to go get her. You're your own person. And before she showed up, you remembered that about yourself. Yeah. And now that she's here, everybody is becoming so helpless and just like falling back onto old patterns. And it's why I love this. Like this book is difficult. Like. <laughs> When Thalia yelled at Percy, I literally like closed the book and set it down next to me for like 15 minutes before I kept reading it because I was so like triggered and upset because that's happened to me 5 million times in my life. <laughs> and so, um, but even though it's difficult, it's the, I love it so much because it's the natural progression of the way that this world is set up, that things like this would happen this way. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it's like, this is exactly what would happen. Like, if you set up a world where one person is at the top and everybody else doesn't know how to do anything, this is like one, like the smartest girl in camp is going to get kidnapped because she feels like she doesn't know what she should do. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that is exactly what would happen if you make everybody feel, feel helpless so that they can all like suck up to daddy Zeus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, and I can say from like experience taking some of that golden child accountability that when you do have all eyes on you, it is a lot of pressure and it is like, I have to live up to this thing. So when you don't, it feels better to blame somebody else than it does to actually say, oh, wow, I fucked up. Um, and especially because there's the feedback loop of you're usually praised and you're usually told you're so great and fabulous and smart and cunning and you you do all the good plans and so she's like i do all the good plans i do all the good it's percy's fault yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and oh someone's asking like has she been that thalia has been a demigod for longer and does it matter like yeah. literally does not matter like hierarchy shit like i've been doing this longer so i know more that's just not true and especially when it comes to this sort of world, it actually is better if you've done it for less time because you haven't had your brain be like warped by like the gods telling you that things just work this way and this is the only way things are supposed to work. No, mm -hmm. Percy is better at literally every single thing they ever have to do ever in any of these books because he was not at camp until he was 12. Mm -hmm. And he is brand new to all of this stuff, and he doesn't have that programming that he needs to, like, decondition himself from. There is yeah. no programming for him to decondition from. And so he is better at literally everything because he doesn't have that. Dahlia being at camp around, like, on the run longer or just knowing about the gods longer, even if for a good part of it she was a tree, she was still, like, there. Even if you count the times when she was on the run, mm -hmm. that's just stuff that she knew about this world already that she has in her mind like she clearly thinks that because she is zeus's kid that she is like she should be getting this attention she should be the ones that people are going to because i get like the golden child thing that it's the role that she has but she still wants to have that role she's not like trying to argue against having that role yeah. as opposed to the way that percy argues against everything ever that anyone ever tries to get him to do and so him not knowing as much in that way is actually better. It's why he's successful mm -hmm. in the end when everyone else is not. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's hard to step back and let somebody have the spotlight sometimes. It took me going to therapy for me to be able to do that for my brother. The fact that I'm no contact with my mom automatically means she spends a lot of time with him because you know she does so um he's finally getting the attention he probably always needed and um you know now when my dad compares the two of us on a phone call he's like oh but your brother could never do that I'm like but he could or no but he does this thing better than me i always make sure to follow it up with like a compliment or no i'm not gonna let you say michael's not good at something he's just not good at it in the way you want him to be mm -hmm. Or like, do you even know if he's not good at it? Or are you, or are you just like saying that he is?
Mm -hmm. that happens a lot to us people just like decide <laughs> yeah. that we're like not good at something and or we don't want to do something and like have this has never been asked of me before how did you possibly know what i would say yeah <laughs> yeah so it's really hard to get there it took me years of therapy to get there but it i there's hope for talia because she's young you know like i'll say that and i do think she does ultimately step aside and let Percy take the reins. But yeah, it's it takes a while for her to realize she's not the best person and this responsibility that's being put on her is also unfair to her just as much as it is to Percy. I'm not even sure she ever actually realizes that. She just kind of is like, I don't want to do this. Peace. <laughs> and, and like... She has immortality. She'll get there. <laughs> hopefully she does as either way when she's not like you know there anymore she's a lot nicer to him so that's at least something that she's not around as much and so she doesn't she doesn't treat him nearly as bad like past this book because i don't know why she just maybe she doesn't care as much anymore after she doesn't have to deal with it anymore yeah um but the other thing we find out in this chapter is we still get Artemis kind of like being very vague when um, the reason she had called Percy into the tent was because Bianca was trying to relay everything that Dr. Thorne had been saying, the manticore Dr. Thorne. And um, she's like, well, Bianca didn't really understand what she was hearing. So let's bring in Percy because Percy probably understood more since he's been in the world a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And so Percy relays some stuff about well, he's talking about the general, the great stirring pot. I love that he gets it wrong. <laughs> um, and Artemis automatically knows Zoe is about to say, oh my gosh, that's this thing, but she stops her. And so Percy doesn't get to find out yet who the general is or what they are talking about. Mm -hmm. There is like a little bit of a clue for anyone who's read these books before and remembers them i do remember who the general is so i did like at least pick up on this that zoe they comment that zoe looks terrified mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> i'm a little bit nicer when it comes to the fact that zoe also helps like trick these young girls into joining artemis because she's because of that <laughs> Uh, which will like make sense later when you know who the general is and stuff why i'm being nicer to her um yeah. there is like that little bit of a clue that is something that you would only usually pick up on if you know who that is already because it's such a small thing um mm -hmm. i generally i honestly don't remember what the thing is that she's going after i know it's a thing in this book but i don't remember what it is what it yeah. is anymore. <laughs> But she goes off on a secret mission where she can't even take Zoe. She's taking none of her hunters. And that's why Percy needs to be the person to escort them back. And then she calls Apollo to give them a ride. Yeah, and that's where we leave off at chapter three. Chapter four kind of picks up with the Apollo stuff. Um, so let's see. Um, I made a lot more notes in chapter four for some reason. So... Um, we know that she's like waiting for sunset for Apollo to get there because she's looking to the east. Um, Percy notes that even though he he says she looked to the east as if she was expecting something, and it's like, bro, she just called her 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 brother the sun chariot. <laughs> yeah, but still, you don't think that it's actually gonna be one. Mm -hmm. Like that yeah. is just like doesn't make sense to your brain that it well, would. Yeah, and Percy explains it so well too. He's like, well, you know, I've taken muggle science classes and i i know that the sun is a flaming ball of gas so it's hard to conceptualize that it's it turns out to be a maserati mm -hmm. it's like what am i what what's happening yeah like how is that possible i i really liked how they explain that like how apollo explains it of like this is like how mortals picture it to look like so that's just what it looks like that's just how they would picture to see it and so that's just how I look because that's just how this works and I'm like yeah that actually makes sense that because that does happen like so many people um like with just with like spirituality stuff alone mm -hmm. like there's a lot of people who genuinely believe that there's like demons or hell is real and things like that 
and they generally think sometimes that they see those things or that like dead loved ones are saying those things to them when they're not when they're not saying them but because they have that like like structure in their mind that that is how those things work they expect it to be there so that's just what they see mm -hmm. and it's like a giant planet is not something that you could conceptualize in your mind but you can conceptualize something like this yeah um let's see we also get a note about him being so lazy in the winter which i thought was like a funny like ideological little slip in there about daylight savings um we find out talia thinks he's hot <laughs> um let's see um and then okay so i put a note um and this was from my first read back in like 2009 um where uh, I was not happy at first with Rick choosing to ignore the mythology of Artemis being the firstborn. Um, and I will just go on a tiny rant because I otherwise love his choices with mythology, but the reason why Artemis being the firstborn is so cool is because she is a goddess of childbirth. And as a goddess of childbirth, she helped deliver her own twin. Like, that's super fucking cool <laughs> so i kind of i'm sad for her that that part's taken out and i kind of get the vibe he was going for with them and why he took it out like it it kind of matches the vibe of their personality a little bit more um but i still i love that part of her mythology so much i get that i like that she's not the oldest because she needs to be knocked down like 75 pegs and it and i like that it's like something that she can never change like no matter how serious she is about abducting little girls and mm -hmm. i didn't even talk about the fact that she makes herself look like a little girl to make them join her faster which is so creepy yeah i mean and, but like just she's so she's such like this serious person that's just like i'm so much smarter than my brother and so much better than him in every possible way because men are stupid and men are horrible and men do horrible whatever um i just like the fact that no matter what she does about all of that like no matter what she says he is always older than her yeah <laughs> and i just like that that it has to bother her every second of her life and at least that's and it's just funny because it's just one thing that he can always say to her of like i'm i'm always older than you though <laughs> yeah I think Rick definitely wrote that in because she's very serious and he's very not. And it's so apparent from the moment he pulls up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see. So uh, the reason I brought up Artemis acknowledging Percy first is because then we have the opposite. Apollo acknowledging Talia first. And in a, in a sense, you could almost guess that that would happen because they're, they're technically half siblings. But at the same time, he's not, it doesn't seem like he's doing it because of that. And he just like makes a joke, oh, they always turn all the pretty girls into trees. Yeah, and especially because he like sits there and just looks at Percy, like he's like, you're Percy Jackson, right? And he's like, yeah, and he just stares at him. And I'm like, can you not think about how you are wondering if you should kill this child in front of him? Like, I know that's what you're thinking right now. Can you at least pretend like you're not thinking about that right now? <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> and I know from the things you've told me about the Apollo trials, he later is going to regret how he treats Percy. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's interesting, the the duality, like, because they're, they're meant to be duality embodied of her being the logical one and going to Percy first him being the more fun outgoing one and going to talia first mm -hmm. and <laughs> i'm sorry i'm laughing about the whole thing with talia in this chapter where she's um she's afraid of heights mm -hmm. and, and how her like golden childness means that she's just like she's not admitting that that she's oh. afraid of it I didn't that's realize why, that. Yeah, that's why she's acting so weird in this chapter is because she's afraid of heights. She's a Zeus kid and never flies because she's afraid of heights. They all have like weird fears like that. Like Percy at some point later, much later on, he like develops a fear of drowning, which is just like the ironic thing that he 
he has, a, he, has a, he has a very good reason for why he's afraid of that but he does become afraid of that even though he is a Poseidon kid and so it's just like the irony of that that um that she is a Zeus kid and she's afraid of she never flies because she's afraid of heights and so that's why she's acting so weird and this whole chapter she won't just say that she won't yeah. say like somebody else, like Percy should fly because I'm afraid of heights and, and I'm not going to be able to do this the right way and instead like almost crashes like five different times because she's just trying to act like she's <laughs> she's not she's not terrified and it's yeah, like if you skip step, so please. she's joyriding she's joyriding the sun chariot and it's shaped like a bus at the moment and the like she tries to get out of it by saying i don't know that i'm old enough mm -hmm. but apollo then uses his like prophecy powers to be like okay well you aged this much as a tree so you're actually about to turn 16. so technically you would have a learner's permit right now go ahead and drive the car child and also like we didn't talk about this but Grover being like a fanboy for Artemis and them just being like, can you, can you like get a grip on yourself? <laughs> it's like how she loves nature. It's like, okay, but she hates you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, that's the, that's a common misconception about like hunters and fishers and fishermen and stuff is like this idea that they don't love nature. If you if you want to hunt good prey, you're going to want to protect the environment of that prey, and you're going to do it in a responsible way where you're only doing it to overpopulated animal. And I think that Artemis is kind of like the embodiment of that. Like that's what the hunt is for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, she does love nature, and that's very on brand for somebody who hunts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of hunting where I live, and we still like nature and want to protect it somehow. Mm -hmm. That's why it's here. Yeah, like, I will never agree with people going to Africa and shooting lions and shit, but, like, no. if you're gonna be here and hunt wild boar or deer or things like that, that actually we have a hunting season for, then it makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, We the one here that's the biggest deal is deer hunting and it's purely just because they get overpopulated mm -hmm. if you don't do that and um but like it's one of the things that's funny like living here is that it's very normal to just see them around mm -hmm. um like almost every apartment i've lived in there's been like a deer just like in the parking lot at some point just like hanging out and we're like oh hi yeah. and like literally how it goes people just say hi to them and talk to them and they usually just sit there and look at you for a couple of seconds and scamper off. Or you get, or if sometimes they'll let you give you give them food, but it's a very like copacetic thing like that. Like you, we like seeing them and we like to be nice to them along with the other wild animals we have mm -hmm. um, because they're part of where we live. Yeah. So um, yeah, Grover's fanboying over over her. And Talia kind of has a moment where she fanboys over Apollo, but mostly she's just scared for her life as she's flying the sun chariot. So, um, yeah, she's like death gripping. As you said, she almost crashes five times. Percy notes that like trees, the tops of trees are lighting like uh, birthday candles as she's going. And they finally crash into a lake at Camp half <laughs> I think it's so funny, like, this is like the only fun you have as like the scapegoat that Percy has to like, take it towards the end to help her like not just crash. It's those like small moments where you get to like, be the one to do something because the golden child is like flailing. <laughs> that is like the best, those are like the best moments we get. They're like pretty fleeting, but at least they have, they happen at this point, at this point where he was just like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> like, yeah. Let me just help you so you don't kill everybody. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. I'm trying to think if we missed anything. Um, so I know I'm fine. I wanted to talk about stuff with like Artemis stuff some more with like the hunters. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, you had a bunch of like thought experiments of who would be eligible. 
with her turn. Oh, yeah. With the stuff with, hold on. I'm back. Okay. The stuff with Artemis, I just like think, like the way that she put like who gets to be in the hunters was mm -hmm. like super not nice to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like so like one of the thing like one of the things her saying is I forget the exact line of how she puts it, but it was basically like once you're like involved with men or like once you have sex, you're like you've like lost your way. Mm -hmm. Or you're like less than and you can't join anymore. Yeah. And, and so not only did that make me think about generally like trans people, like I was like would she be okay with trans people joining? Like, I don't know if that's necessarily, I said that in a way where I didn't think anyone was actually gonna give me the answer. And then a bunch of people tried to give me the answer. <laughs> and I was like, this is just me thinking about this because it's just like a weird thing to think about of like, if like she would let, would she let trans women in, but she wouldn't be okay with like trans, like, I feel like she would hate trans men so much because they gave up being a woman to become a man and that's just like a really weird thought or like a really weird thing that that yeah. is seen as like this like nice other thing that people can be a part of but but like you sound like a turf <laughs> and like somebody in like my my comment section today was like demanding me you need to explain how she's like a turf i'm like you why are you giving me demand? I'm not gonna tell you just because you're demanding it of me. Like, calm down. But, yeah. like, just to like explain it for better. Like, a lot of the kind of turf rhetoric is that like you being a woman is connected to like your femininity is connected to like your vaginal <laughs> and like having being able to have children is and like a very like purity culture sort of ideas of like being a woman is connected to like being able to have children or just like stereotypically like feminine things mm -hmm. and so the idea then is like that a lot of people bring up with turfs is like okay what about like cis women who can't have children are they like less of a woman because they aren't able to get pregnant and it's just that like connection to like very old kind of archaic ways of what was seen as being a woman as being the most important thing about you it's just like why does that like why does she want immediately to get bianca to join but she doesn't care about percy like yeah. percy has saved the world twice already by this point he's a much more powerful demigod but she doesn't consider asking him to join because he's a boy and it's like what about him being a boy makes him less than bianca who abandons her younger brother as if it's nothing like she's objectively a worse person <laughs> than percy for doing that but she doesn't but she sees percy as less than and like zoe sees percy and nico as less than as well and it's like what a just because they're a boy and so it just I always have to question any kind of situation going on where like trans people would not be allowed purely because of whatever their gender expression is. And then I'm also like, I'm gender fluid. Would you hate half of me? Like, would I not be allowed to join <laughs> because yeah. I'm gender fluid or something? Um, that would be Someone really with the username. Um, so it doesn't sound weird on my end though. So I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, so um, I think I think it's hard to to picture what like Artemis is truly wanting here uh, because the the mythology doesn't tell us much. The mythology mm -hmm. tells us that like you know Artemis probably at the age she stunted herself at, at in this book um, sat on her daddy Zeus's lap and was like I never want to grow up or get married or have babies or anything and he was like sure honey you never have to and that's what we know of her is that she like she made this pledge to her dad that she wanted to be a maiden forever she just wanted to wear her short little toga and go hunt small animals and hang out with deer all day um and so she's meant to be this idea of sweet little girlhood before they get married but 
I don't know where that gets convoluted to like little girls aren't allowed to want romance. They're not allowed to, um, you know, like have some of those desires to want to grow up someday because even kids of like six, seven years old will play dress up and play house and, um, you know, like play with baby dolls and stuff. It's a very natural urge for little girls to eventually want to be parents and even little boys like even William was you know very much I wanted to be a dad when he was like five or I want to be a dad someday yeah and one thing people told me mm-hmm. is that in the Trials of Apollo books there is a lesbian couple that gets kicked out because they're a lesbian couple and so it's like okay so it's not even just about being with men it's about being with anybody it's about sexuality it's yeah, about I, discovering that. I take like a weird offense to that it, yes. for a lot of different reasons, but just to like start with it, because I'm, I don't know, nobody ever know, for, feels super sure that you're aromantic. <laughs> um, that's just one of those things that we always, because nobody can ever tell us what romantic attraction is. And so we never know for sure, but there's a good po- possibility that I am at least ace and it could be arrow. <laughs> And I don't know if I am. And so Rick Riordan has said that, you know, he sees Artemis as that. And it's pretty obvious that that is how she is presented if we take, like, what what we know now about sexuality. But mm-hmm. she's the worst kind of, yeah. like, ace and arrow person because she's so, like, black and white about it. Of, like, if you have sex at all, you're disgusting. Or if you want to be in a relationship at all, you need to get away from me. And, like, half of, like, the battle with, like, getting people to understand asexuality is to get people to understand that it doesn't work that way, that, or just, like, I guess also the idea that to her, love involves having sex with someone. That love only happens in, like, romantic relationship, romantic, like, sexual relationships. And Mm -hmm. it's, like, love happens all the time. Love happens in platonic relationships. Love happens in relationships where you never want to do anything like that. And so it's just the idea that she thinks that if you do that, that that means that you're experiencing love. It's like ace people experience love. And that's like, that's literally something that people say to us. Like they think that we don't because we don't want to be in a romantic relationship. And it's like, that's not the only way that you experience love though. And then there's also the thing that just because you're asexual and you don't experience sexual attraction doesn't mean that you won't have sex with somebody. Yeah. If you love them and you know that it will make them happy, like people have sex with people all the time. They're not sexually attracted to like people talk about it and make jokes about it. I see it all the time, even though I don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. And so that's not like a new concept or anything like that, that people will do that. So it's like she's like the most rigid version, which makes sense for how she's presented in the stories and how like the gods are in general, like they don't have any nuance or anything like that. But it's just one of those things of that's not actually how people are when that you have that sort of like the idea that I would like toss somebody out of my life because they, um, you know, mm-hmm. like to be in a relationship with somebody is just really weird. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just not something that I would ever want to do. Yeah. So, um, my comments, uh, the books were written at a time when sensuality was black and white ish. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I just looked at the the trademark 2008, which was the year that I graduated high school. I don't think gay marriage was federally legal yet. I think it might have been just legal in my state of California and a few other states. Um, And like when I went to high school, you know how they'll have like LGBTQ clubs. They were called the Gay Straight Alliance when people like you and me went to high school. They weren't, you know, like all inclusive of trans and bisexuality and stuff like that. Bisexuality was, I mean, I went to high school in the era of Katy Perry. I kissed a girl and I liked it. Um, So, you know, it was seen as if you're a girl and you're saying you're bi, you're trying it on for men's view. Yeah, and to be honest, I'm not critiquing like Rick Riordan's writing even. I'm more like just critiquing the more the fact that if this is a god like this is a greek god and this is like her myth like this is how she is presented 
And but if you put that into the into the modern day, which is the literal point of these books, is to take these ancient beings and put them into our modern day, you have to apply like modern things to these old ideas. That's the whole point of these books. And so like even though it makes sense for Artemis to be feeling this way, it's like, yeah, but but she's like a character in these stories. And so the fun of it is to like actually think about what this would be like if if because she's interacting with a lot of kids that go through a lot of bad things. And so it's like, but what about like certain situations like that would come up? Like what would she do in situations like that, that I just have to like wonder about, especially because people generally like her a lot. And I'm like, have you thought about what it would be like if like she turned away like a trans man or something like that, or that she, she would, she would, probably hate a trans man because they gave up being a woman and it, like that's just very much what she's like or just the thing that like I could not get out of my head and was like making me way too upset today was the idea of like if you're a child sex abuse victim does she count being raped as having sex like would she turn me away after I was six from joining the hunters would she say that i was not allowed to join yeah because that happened to me yeah she would <laughs> she would tell me i would be not allowed to join and it's yeah. like and it's more like you're saying that you're like a paragon of like womanhood that you want to protect girlhood or womanhood you're protecting nothing like just gonna say that that if kids like especially kids but anybody if anybody is raped at any point and you count that as having sex and that they are no longer innocent and that they have like given something away where they are no longer allowed to join your group because somebody else did that to you you are making what men do the most important thing about them and that's like really how, how why it um it makes me think of like turfiness is that they make like they whittle down women to like the simplest most like offensive things about who you are as a person they make the smallest thing about you your entire personality and it's like if me as like a child sex abuse victim goes to artemis and is like can i join your group and she says no because you had sex before i've never had sex before i've been raped there's a big difference there there was no point in what happened to me but she mm -hmm. he, she would likely see it because the only thing that matters to her and like that sort of thinking is what a man did to me. It doesn't matter who I am as a person, what I've been through, none of that matters. That's the only thing that matters is what somebody else did to me. And it's that whole idea of like, oh, but I'll like kill the person that hurt you. And it's like, that solves no problems that creates bigger ones. Yeah. Because now I feel guilty that this person that I knew and loved was killed because of you. And then also I am still left with nothing. I don't have a support system still. <laughs> I don't have community still. I don't have anything. And you're like not letting people join who want those things and don't have those things in their life because of things that they can't control. And it's just like, that's what would happen if somebody went through something like that and they talk to her in this story and there likely are demigods that went through something like that yeah. because the parents that they're involved with and are around are not good people so most of the time they're not and so it's just one of those things to think about of like can i like a god that would like turn me away because of that and be like no yeah. like no fuck artemis <laughs> like no i'm not going to like a god who even if she likes nature and even if she is a romantic and asexual, the place that I should feel like I can, that I would fit in, it's just another way of like femininity being very limited mm -hmm. to like one definition. And like, that's been like my entire life is that I've never fit. I guess the, the thing I kept just thinking over and over again today was like when you're when you go through like really bad stuff when you're a kid especially that sort of a thing you cannot be like a soft like feminine person 
-hmm. you will die. You will, it's not an exact, you will literally die <laughs> if you are soft. You have to be strong. You have to be resilient. You have to be really tough yeah. in order to get through that. Not because you want to, but because you have to. Like, I didn't have that choice to be like a soft, like feminine girl who would like cry over movies and wear dresses and want to be something like that. That was not an option for me. Mm -hmm. And so like, it feels just like really wrong that this like fun version of a God that's supposed to be like the paragon of like girlness and femininity that like accepts everybody, I know wouldn't accept somebody like me. Yeah. And I just hate that. <laughs> and I and I think it's like kind of fascinating that most people like her and have like not thought about this sort of thing. But it this sort of thing is something that would come up if she was like a real person or a real character who interacts with people in these stories. Yeah, it's it's sad to think because I can see Artemis like I'm trying to think of the way to put this. It's almost like the way that people think that like god will save them in certain situations you know that's the kind of situation that she's supposed to be protecting she's supposed to be the protectress of women and children and it's like so did you let this happen to me and now i can't join your gang like yeah. what yeah, it's just the extreme genderness just always makes me feel really uncomfortable like even that one myth about her where a man sees her naked and so she turns the man into a woman mm -hmm. like some people would be like oh she's fine with trans people because of that and i'm like that's not really being trans though because she forced him to become a woman mm -hmm. and it's also just a thing of like why is it okay for a woman to watch you when you're naked if it's not okay for it's not okay for either of them to do that just for the record <laughs> like, well, yeah, houses were are a different culture thing so i don't i don't want to like knock that too hard but yeah it's yeah. uncomfortable no matter what um and, and it's more just the yeah. idea of uh, that like the fix that she had for that situation was oh if i turn him into a woman everything is fine and it's like why no. <laughs> why is that suddenly fine well, some of the mythology snobs like to like make the oi their end oi, the, if I could talk, the oi their end all be all of like mythology sources. Um, that myth is listed under wrath. It's not listed under favor. So it was meant to be a punishment very much. Yeah. Somebody in my comments said that she was punishing him because the worst thing for a man to be is a woman. And I was like, look, that is like a 70 page thing piece of <laughs> like that is what they thought it, it, yeah. it is a sign of the time. Yeah. And it, it's honestly, that's something that men even now still have issues with. Most of the problems between men and women is that when men are boys, like feminine or like girly things like being a girl, being girly or like things like that are seen as like a bad thing or seen as like that's like the ultimate joke of like oh you're being a little sissy or you're being a girl things like that and so that's where more of that weird and animosity that i see straight people just engage in for god knows what reason like <laughs> <laughs> happens that's why the that stuff happens and so it's not even like an outside topic but it's more of like stating it as if like that's just like a fact and i'm like yeah but that's that's wrong <laughs> That's like what I'm trying to say and yeah. you're not getting what I'm trying to say here, but like the idea that like a God is just like, yeah, if I just turn him into a, a, a woman, he'll be like so embarrassed that he'll never tell anybody about what I look like when I when I'm naked. And it's just like it's it. I just don't like it that this version of like gods that are supposed to be higher than humans are also engaging in gender politics. <laughs> so like, can we stop? Like it's yeah. I, like, can we can there be one place in life where that doesn't happen? Like Rick Riordan himself, the way that he writes this, you're not supposed to be like, this is great. <laughs> I'm really glad that like that, you know, Nico and Percy are being completely ignored the way that they are. Like, it's very clear from the way that he presents this, that it, this isn't something you should be like excited about. Like you're supposed to find Artemis and the hunters interesting, of course. But you're not like sitting there like you're not he's not he's not writing it in a way where he's like trying to make excuses for for them to act this way or to think that it's okay. 
you're so you're upset like percy is upset he's like yelling at them in this in this book when they're like grooming bianca into joining them you're obviously not supposed mm -hmm. to think that what they're doing is okay and that just like continues on as this book goes on and so like i think that's almost like a good thing for people to notice is like just because rick riordan writes it doesn't mean that he's saying that that thinking that way is all right like look at what his characters are doing and especially what percy is doing like how does percy feel about this he's really upset about this and yeah. and it's depressed and feels like everything he just went through was for no reason like you're obviously not supposed to be happy that this happened to him and that artemis acts this way is like we can't think of these gods as moralistic they were never meant to be moralistic like even homer is writing about them throwing bitch fits at each other and like literally fighting each other um and i think that that's why they are so fun to work with in works of fiction like this is because they are flawed gods we're not pretending like they're all perfect like the christian god you know like where's the fun in that you know there's there's no character arc to get over there's no fatal flaw there's no um, rigid thinking that gets you into stupid trouble. So um, like the gods very much represent that. And in a way it's a lot more predictable than saying this God is all knowing and all good and all loving and still is gonna protect you and stuff. Cause at least you could be like, these ones are fickle and they never make sense. And they also are assholes. So like, if they happen to favor me, I'm just gonna kiss their ass. Yeah, like We've been sending TikTok videos back and forth about how the ocean keeps eating billionaires. Yep. And I like set the joke that Poseidon is trying to suck up to Percy to get him to talk to him some more. Yeah. But that's generally kind of, so this is like, I know that people use media literacy right now as like a dig in a way that is not logical. Like people will just say that when someone just has a different opinion than them about something when it doesn't apply. Yeah. But one place that it does apply when it comes to this book series is the idea that people don't think about like, oh, Rick wrote this in a book, so he thinks that it's okay. And it's like, no, that's, that's, it's not that simple. Like, what are the people actually doing in mm -hmm. this book? That is what, that's what shows whether Rick is okay with it or not, or whether you want to be okay with it or not. Because a lot of people, when you bring that stuff up, they say like oh well rick wrote it in this book so it's obviously fine and it's like is it though because he wrote it in this book where there where these other things are happening mm -hmm. people almost like need to like think about it in a bigger way of like what is rick trying to say though by what these characters are going through or like how they're acting because just because a character in a book in the book series says it does it mean that rick is saying that thinking that way is okay yeah and i see this the most when it comes to like luke stuff that a lot of people are like oh well you know luke had like a sad backstory and so rick told us about that so obviously we're supposed to like let the things he does slide and it's like no that's that's not how that stuff works either but i see it come up today with like artemis where a, a freaking video i made got like 3,000 views in like two hours because people were arguing with me <laughs> so much in the comments because they were so just mad that I asked them like would trans people join the hunters and I was like I don't think that some of them would like eventually I got to people that were like yeah she would never let trans men in and yeah. but like but it was more just the general idea that I was even questioning that made people so mad and I'm like I don't know why no one's thought about this before and it's not me saying that Rick Riordan doesn't like trans people. That's obviously not true with the way that he writes his stories. He has an entire book series of just trans people, basically, which is Magnus Chase. And so he's obviously very much okay with all of them at all time. But like, it's more just the thing of like, just because Rick is writing it, doesn't mean that he agrees with what his characters are doing. Exactly. And I just like almost like am interested to see if more people reread the books like we are. Mm -hmm. um as they get older and see if they like feel differently about certain things when they go back and read them as they're older because i guarantee you that you'll feel very differently artemis used to be one of my favorite gods yeah like our first ever podcast i'm pretty sure i said that i loved her and, yeah. I, and I also said that i loved hermes <laughs> and i don't like any either one of them anymore yeah. at all and so it's like it 
you know, as you get older, your perspective changes, which is the fun of a story like this. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to think about this stuff. And like, even the, the tweets that I found of him where he said like, yeah, um, Artemis is arrow and ace. The rest of them is him saying like the hunters though is like up for debate because yeah. they could be being celibate, which is not being asexual, obviously that's abstaining from a need that you do have. Mm-hmm. And which is why some of them end up do leaving when they do want to be in a relationship like that. But yeah. like he says himself, like, yes, the God is that way, but everyone else in the hunters is like, whatever you think is happening is what you think is happening. It, they yeah. could be anything. And it's not like, it's not set in stone in the way that it is with her. And so he wants you to think about that and like, think about what you would want or who, what you think is going on with these people. Yeah. And I, I mean, it does represent this archaic belief that there's something inherently different about you before you lose your virginity or that virginity is even a concept at all. Yeah. Um, and like it's just it's complete bullshit and i think that that really is part of rick's argument here that like that idea that certain people should be exempt from this potentially life-saving thing and some shouldn't be just based off of gender or some stupid factor like that i think that like he is making the statement that that's bullshit i think he's speaking through percy here Mm -hmm. um she wouldn't leave them in because men not because they're men not because they're trans. So um, Artemis did have a couple of hunter friends that were men. They weren't strict like the hunters as is in Rick Riordan doesn't exist in mythology. So um, there was Orion who was like a hunting buddy, but um, he gets like stellified. Um, he said he was going to hunt all the animals on Earth, and Gaia sends a scorpion after him. And then there was Hippolytus. That story is actually like he was Ace Arrow by choice. Um, Aphrodite sends her wrath on him, and Artemis later saves him. Um, so she does, she'll favor men in the right circumstances, but not all of them. And, like, honestly, if you reject someone because they're a trans man and say, well, just, just because it's a man, that doesn't make you look less transphobic true so like who cares <laughs> like yeah. honestly like who cares if you're rejecting a good person from your group and using the fact that because you're accepting them as being a trans man you're still like rejecting them from a community mm-hmm. because of because you think that their maleness somehow is the most somehow like distorts who they are as a person enough where they aren't good enough to join when if they never transitioned they would have yeah like, that's not any better either. <laughs> yeah, and just to get Clark going in the YouTube comments, um, so when we think about, like, J.K. Rowling and her idea that, like, women need this protection from some big bad trans person that's going to assault them in restrooms and stuff, things like in this series, like Cersei, we saw it in Sea of Monsters, where she has this eyelid, she protects these girls from men. And Artemis has these hunters where she's protecting these girls from men. It comes from what they think is a good place. It comes from a place that they think is, you know, like protecting something that they see needing protected. But it's so misguided that it ends up hurting more than it ends up helping. Yeah, and I didn't say this already, but I really hate the like whole social construct that is like virginity. Mm-hmm. Like, so I still have like complexes about if I could even call myself that or not. Yeah, like, every therapist I've asked them that, like, like what am I even? I don't know. Um, and they like they sit there and tell me like you can call yourself a virgin if you want to because you really are in like most ways and i'm like but i'm really not though but i am but i'm not and so like the fact that that concept does not make sense to me at all because it it doesn't work like in my situation and i'm definitely not the only person in that sort of a situation um it just it doesn't it's a horrible construct i guess is what i'm trying to say and so the whole like jk rowling stuff of it all is just the idea that like you know the idea that if you decide to have sex with anyone that that makes you suddenly like more adult 
or like somehow better or different or something like the way that it reminds me a lot of the way that people talk about 18 year olds like if you're like 27 and you wait until an 18 year old turns 18 they're not magically more mature at that age that makes it okay for you to be in a relationship with them but people like play that line because it's just like the legal line but it's like but that doesn't actually change anything like you're not magically more mature when you turn 18 you're just able to like vote and you could be like put into the military and you can buy like cigarettes at least in the united states those are like the things that you can do that you can't do when you're 17. um but it doesn't like you don't change as a person just because you turn 18 in the same way that if you do like sexual things that doesn't suddenly make you more of an adult um or like mean that you can like handle more things or whatever and so like with the whole jk rowlingness of her life of how I said, you know, the, our, our, our like super friend Clark, who I'm pretty sure has never actually watched any of our videos, but comments on all of them because he asks things that we like explain in our videos. So I'm like, you've never watched any of these, have you? One, <laughs> um, the last, the last thing he said to me that he never responded to. So I'm like, did I win an argument with this person? Finally, he said something about like, you know, oh, JK Rowling is just wanting to like protect women why is that like a bad thing and i responded and said like because she's not like that's the entire point is that she's not protecting anybody she's going after a group of people that aren't actually hurting anyone and women are still being harmed every single day by the people who actually are and they're not the people that she's going after and so she's spending all of this time going after a very marginalized group of people that are not the ones that are actually doing things to other people. And like what you were saying about the like female characters in this world kind of getting like benefit of the doubt, like Cersei and Artemis are not seen the same way as like more predatory men characters are. They're mm -hmm. just as bad. <laughs> They're like almost worse in some situations than some of the male characters that we're seeing, but they get like a pass because people think don't just don't see women as being like that. And that's what happens when you get so stuck in like that sort of gender binary about abuse. If you think that you have to be a man in order to be abusive, you're going to miss like super abusive women and girls yes. that are also around you doing these things that are just as bad, that are even harder for people to talk about because it's not socially acceptable for a woman to be the one hurting you. And so it makes it even harder for people to come forward about that sort of abuse. And it, yeah. it makes it more likely for it to happen. And so that's like the whole irony of a character like Artemis or like real life JK Rowling, where they're trying so hard to protect women from the people they think are hurting them that I guarantee you that they're missing people that are actually doing harm. And they also don't realize that the things that, that they are doing also kind of fall under that category. Mm -hmm. like. JK Rowling like actually shut the fuck up for two weeks of her life because she's being sued by yeah. somebody who she accused of being trans that there would be nothing wrong with with you know Amani uh, like Khalif if she was trans and the Taiwanese boxer that she also accused of being trans there's nothing wrong with them obviously if they were but they're not and but she publicly accused them of being that and like sent a lot of harassment towards their way predicated on the idea that they are but they're not and she's going to get in a lot of financial trouble because she did that yeah and, she literally did harm to women in the name of this turfiness yeah like other how many other women who don't look traditionally like feminine watched that all happen and are now like afraid that like are, that people are going to think that they're not that they're trans when they're and like use that as a reason to attack them mm -hmm. like that's already a difficult situation and i guarantee you that especially black women have had that happen to them already the last few years and are afraid of that continuing more yeah. just because of how racist the ideas of what a woman looks like is and so it's like you're trying so hard to protect women by attacking one 
Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that there's actually, you know, predatory people likely in the turf like community that are likely hurting and harming other people that she would never notice because she doesn't think that they're capable of doing that. In the same way that Artemis could let the worst person ever into the hunters because they're a woman and could be a horrible, like uh, the female version of Luke, like you could let the female version of Luke into the hunters and give them Im immortality so they can do horrible things to people and never die. Yeah. And I don't think that she would even think that they were even capable of doing that because she thinks that because they're a woman, they aren't capable of doing those things. And that's like extremely dangerous to say because women are very much capable of doing just as bad as men are. Mm -hmm. People just don't hear about it as much. Well, I mean, a very, very famous example that I can think of that kind of like illustrates how hard it is to really come forward about what it means to be abused by a woman is Mary Kay Letourneau, because it wasn't until after she passed and they were completely separate from each other that her victim, I forgot what his name was, unfortunately, but like that he started speaking out against her and saying, no, that was wrong. I would never want that for my daughters. Like their interviews together made it seem like, oh no, we're a couple, this is fine. And they were on like, t like talk shows back in the, like, I remember that happening when I was growing up and I was mm -hmm. just like, this isn't right, but they were on like, like Oprah level sort yeah. of shows and stuff. And like, so everyone knew what they, what was happening, but like nobody did anything about it. And it's that whole situation of if the roles were reversed and it was a man, like a male teacher doing that, there's no way that they would have gotten away with it. They would have called the police on them like immediately. They it especially it happened twice. Like she got arrested for it twice. Yeah. They like had multiple children. Like she got divorced from her husband because of it. And it was, there's other stories like, like her, like I've heard a lot. I've heard stories from people that went through sexual abuse from a teacher that was a woman that mm -hmm. I've gotten comments on my fucking TikTok from like boys that are like realizing in real time by listening to me talk that they were abused by like a teacher or an older person that they knew when they were in high school that shouldn't have been doing that stuff to them that did. Mm -hmm. Like there was this one that somebody left me where they said that um, a family member did something to them when they were little and they thought that it didn't count as like abuse like that because there is still that idea that like boys can't be like R worded, which is absolutely not true, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then when he was a teenager, a girl that he wanted to date roofied him and admitted when they started dating that she that she, you know, roofied him and did stuff to him with one of her friends at a party that he didn't even remember what happened. And I was just like, yeah, like imagine how many stories like that are out there about from like teenage boys, if they knew that that was even what was happening to them, there, there would be just as much as there are from girls. And I know that people don't like that, but it's just the reality. Like there isn't like a gender specific role when it comes to abuse. It's just what that person wants. If you don't want to take no for an answer and are willing to like do whatever you want to get what you want, then that's what you're going to do. No matter what your gender identity is, it's not, it's like that whole idea that like trans people are somehow more likely to be predatory because they're trans. And it's like, that's not the, every person who's trans is different from every other person. Your gender identity doesn't suddenly make you into a different person. Yeah. Like, I was just thinking about this because the more the Mormon church just put out atrocious things when it comes to like trans people that are Mormon, including the rules that they're not allowed to use the bathroom if, if children are in there. And I'm like, in the Mormon church, the people that sexually abuse children are men who work for the church. Like, look the around, you that... made the rules, it's probably you guys. Every 30 seconds, their lawsuit gets a phone call from somebody around the country reporting sexual abuse to them, and they're all by men who have positions of authority in the church mm -hmm. that, are, that are being told on. 
Like that is an actual real statistic, but they write, write out a document saying that trans people aren't allowed to use the bathroom when it's their own people that are doing it. And all of the people in power in the Mormon church are men, are cis men, because that's the only people that are allowed to have power. <laughs> and so it's just like that whole idea, like any anytime I see anything like that show up, I just have to talk about it for a while <laughs> because Rick definitely put this stuff into his book to make people question it. Yeah. There's no way that he would be like, yeah, obviously, if you're a man, you're a bad person. When I'm a man <laughs> and my main character is a man, <laughs> a boy yeah. who is like the most empathetic character, one of the most empathetic characters of this whole series. Yeah. And I do think Percy is his own self insert, which is a lot more effective than like JK Rowling's random, like sometimes Hermione is mine and sometimes it's Dumbledore. It's like, no, we don't need the background wise guy, wise girl character to be your self insert. It's a lot more interesting when you acknowledge like your own flaws, your own biases, and unpack that with your main character even. Yeah. Yeah, like Percy is like Rick in the way that, you know, Annabeth is like Becky in the way, like very bare bones, but it still makes me feel like we know who they are because we know Percy and Annabeth so well that I feel like we know them. <laughs> Because yeah. there are certain things that are obviously very similar from how they talk or the way that they phrase things or whatever. Um, but it's done in like a way that Percy is still very separated from who he is as a person. Enough where it's, it's also a thing of like Percy is very like self, I don't know the right word. He doesn't like himself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And so like, he's not sitting there being like, I'm the best. I'm the smartest person in this school, like Hermione is or something. Yeah. Um, or like seen as like the one that has all the answers. Percy is the one that like talks down about himself so much that like we need the point of views from every other character to understand how powerful he actually is. Mm -hmm. And so even if he is his self insert character, he presents him as talking down about how good he is at everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not Rick isn't writing a book being like I'm so cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the opposite, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we covered everything that was in these two chapters. Um. Try to think. There has not been any production news that's that big. We've seen like there's there's pictures of the the kids are together because like Dior just had her birthday. Um, we've seen a few more appearances from other like random Disney stars, but they don't seem too connected yet. Um, like no, no hints of who, who could potentially be other campers that we don't know yet. One thing um, I will say that I thought was really funny is I saw this TikTok video of somebody being like, I think that Disney made Rick Riordan not tell us anything about this season because it's been you know, this amount of a while and he hasn't posted anything on his blog, like during season one, he would post like every couple, every couple weeks or so, just like a little update about how filming was going. Yeah. And I'm like, it's possible that they're not going to do that as much because we all saw the show and we all like it. And so they don't have to like convince us that it's going to be good. Like he had to do when they were filming season one, but also can I just like, remind people that it's August like 26th today and they the last time they did a convention was on August 10th yeah it's only been two full work, work weeks since they did two huge conventions and gave us a teaser trailer and announced more people for casting like they don't need to tell us anything else because hardly anything else has actually happened yeah. I need everyone to be patient like they just started they told us a whole bunch of stuff two weeks ago. What are they going to say? Yeah, we're still filming. <laughs> yeah. like, that's all it, That's all they can say at this point. They haven't started filming scenes, uh, like episode three and four with a new director even yet, where there would be possibly new characters to even tell us about when it comes to casting and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that everybody is really excited, but we have to actually give them time to film. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like we know they've shot a little bit of the chariot race, but if they're going based off of the plot of the book, they might even still be in New York at this point. So 
Uh, yeah, and also, if you, if you want to play a fun game with, like, social media, here's a fun game you can play with, like, the teenage cast. You can figure out who is filming and who is not by how they post their Instagram stories. <laughs> like, I'll just, po I'll just, like, open up Instagram sometimes and, like, Dior, Charlie, and Arian will be, like, all in a row, all posting the same thing that, like, that, like, like the other day when Rick posted his thing about one month until, like, his next book comes out, all three of them all post that all close together. And, like, Leah and Walker didn't for many hours. And I was like, oh, that's who's filming today. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's the one game that I play with social media where I'm like, I can figure this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. I figured like, because I, I've been like hitting some of the share on some of the updates with Disney Plus and the books mm -hmm. too. But yeah, they're probably all sitting together at like a craft services. During it. Yeah. That's that pattern recognition like happening. Like, oh, I see this pattern. Yeah. Hi, like cast members that are over the age of 18 and don't need to do school. Exactly. How you, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot they could do with those three without the other cast in this season too so um I, I also think that it's very funny that in most of the pictures of charlie he's wearing like ralph lauren polo shirts <laughs> and i'm just like, that yacht. Heart in character right now dude <laughs> i'm so excited to see luke wearing boat shoes <laughs> i was like ready for that yacht but the yacht's the movie it's a cruise liner on the yes. bus I want to see, I want like them to be so terrified of Luke. And then he shows up wearing like khaki shorts and like boat shoes and those like checkered socks that like old white men wear when they play golf. The most and, like, old money drip possible. Like, a polo shirt and like a ridiculous like hat and just be like, what's going on guys? You like my sarcophagus? <laughs> and, like he has said that his costume on like the ship is really funny. So I'm assuming it's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but either way, I think it's really funny how he just keeps wearing that preppy stuff now when he doesn't have to. <laughs> I think the Gen Zers call that look old money. Like the the East sense. Coast kind of look. Because it is old money. Yeah. It's like the people that wear the clothes like that are like old money kids who join frats when they get to college. That's who I picture anyway wearing them. That's the kids that wore that stuff when I went to high school with people who, those were all the rich kid clothes. Yeah, I went to high school in the heyday of Abercrombie and Fitch and Hollister and the crazy smelly colognes that they had. Um, so people were popping their collars. There's one girl here on TikTok who will do like makeup or outfit videos, but she's like pretending like it's 2007, 2008. Yeah, and so like, that's that's the era I went to high school. <laughs> yeah, I went in 2003 and Abercrombie and Fitch was still really cool, but it was just that st like all of the rich kids had Abercrombie and Fitch because it was way too expensive for anyone else to buy or like mm -hmm. Banana Republic. Um, and that stuff that that was like the Hollister was still like a cool store, but they all wore like khaki shirts and things like that and wore like ridiculous like boat shoes and other like fancy shoes that probably cost like more money than I made in like two weeks time. <laughs> yeah, it was um, Uggs and Juicy sweat Sweatsuits was kind of like the California girl, like if you had money, look. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, very Paris Hilton. <sighs> <laughs> Just remembering all of that. <laughs> Yeah, such great times. Um, okay, so for next podcast, we are going to read chapters five and six, and maybe seven. We'll see how far I get because I'm usually the one that reads less. So, yeah, wherever is best for us to stop is where we'll stop. We'll let people know beforehand if you like to read along with us which chapters we do. Yeah, and yeah, so we're picking up at camp next week. Should be interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right.